we know we can do better on sort of both counts. Like, can you make it more private? Can you give me some more bits? We're growing the team for that reason. Like we're not going anywhere. Maybe that's going to be sad news for some people, but Privacy Sandbox has a lot more to do than just third-party cookie deprecation and, and the current set of APIs that are out there. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Identity Architects, the InfoSum podcast that spotlights the incredible leaders in the media industry shaping the future of data-driven advertising. I'm your host, Ben Chiquetti, and if there's been one topic that has dominated the advertising industry trade news over the last few years, it's been the deprecation of third-party cookies. And more recently, there's been two names synonymous with that deprecation, Google and the Privacy Sandbox. So for this week's episode, I'm incredibly excited that Lauren Wetzel, our COO at InfoSum, had the chance to sit down with Alex Cohn, Senior Product Manager on the Privacy Sandbox. Before we jump into that conversation, this is your reminder to hit that subscribe button so you'll always be the first to know when the latest episodes of Identity Architects drop. But without any further delay, here's Lauren and Alex. I'm so excited to welcome someone I've long admired, Alex Cohn, to InfoSum's Identity Architects podcast. So, welcome. Thank you. I I feel the same way about you. This is I'm very excited to have a conversation with you, and I guess everyone gets to hear it. <laughs> yeah, they do. We are recording. In fact. <laughs> We usually open things up by asking for people to introduce themselves and their company. I have a sneaky suspicion there's not a single person in our Identity Architects audience listening to this who doesn't know who Google is. But for anyone who doesn't know you, Alex, can you give us a quick intro to yourself and your role? Yeah. So Alex Cohn, uh, product manager on the Privacy Sandbox team. At Google, the Privacy Sandbox team sits in what we call the Platforms and Ecosystems org, which has Chrome and Android, Chrome OS, sort of what you would think about for, for platforms and ecosystems. Um, yeah, and my role within the team uh, is really horizontal across all of the technologies that we're building to you know, be building blocks for the ecosystem as we move away from cross-site identifiers, uh, that third-party cookies being the most well-known. So I'm really been helping the team on how we go to market. And um, yeah, it's 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 one of the most fun things I've ever worked on. I think it, it might be the most fun thing I've ever worked and on. And we're going to get into that today. But what, what other roles did you have leading up to this that you wanted to maybe... Yeah. So background, I'm I'm actually maybe, yeah, this month, I'm 11 years into ad tech. Uh, I started ad tech career at, at AppNexus, uh, product manager there, um, worked on a bunch of different things like video and deals and the publisher ad server and privacy creative. Uh, it's actually where I met you, Lauren, when we became Xander. Um, spent a little bit of time at IAB Tech Lab uh, as sort of privacy and addressability became the focal point topics back in like 2020. And then did a little short stint uh, with somebody who I may have mentioned a couple times during this podcast, Julia Schulman, um, working, just helping people with ads privacy strategy sort of across product and legal. So yeah, I've been in, been in ad tech for a little bit and uh, mostly mostly product management, but uh, from a, a few different vantage points. That's super helpful. And we always traditionally start with quick fire questions. So Let's I'm going to throw some questions at you. And it starts with your earliest memory of advertising. Yeah, it was hard for me to narrow it. To, there's like four. We can hear four. <laughs> four commercials that I remember like really distinctly, but I don't know which one was first. I remember like, and, and it's all based on the jingles. So these are commercials. So Juicy Fruit, Big Red, and I could sing these oh, two please. if you want. Um, probably <laughs> you don't. Uh, Folgers, best part of it. Yeah. Uh, and then c c Connect Four. And I don't know which one was, uh, yeah, but I could, if sometime if you are in the chandelier bar with me at CBS, <laughs> Uh, listener, I will sing all four of those to you word for word. I love it. What did you want to be when you were younger while watching those Juicy Fruit commercials? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I I moved around a little bit, but I had a family member, my my mom's dad, who is history professor, mm -hmm. and that seemed really cool to me. A little later on in life, I wanted to be a bureaucrat, <laughs> um, which actually may explain why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Uh, but I wasn't that young at that point. Uh, yeah. And what was your first job in either advertising or marketing? I assume maybe up Nexus. Yeah. So, I mean, if you, if you take an expansive view, uh, I did like co digital comms and marketing actually for a few nonprofits before I joined AppNexus, but AppNexus, yeah, was my first like advertising job. And that was February, 2013. And what drew you to it? Like, and, and maybe said differently, what also just keeps you in it if they're the same thing? Yeah. So with AppNexus, it was it was people. It was a guy named Justin Pines, who's really great, who introduced me to Suzanne O'Kelly, Brian's sister. And what I liked about them was neither one of them viewed me in a silo in terms of what I was capable of. And that seemed really cool. And I didn't know much about ad tech at that point, but I was like, this this seems great. These people are going to let me try something new. What What's kept me in it? Um, I would say finding this intersection of my policy background, which I didn't really talk about, but, um, and then my deep love of product management or like working with people to build and commercialize product. It's so, like this intersection of privacy and, and, and product like is what keeps me in it. Yeah. Which is in, I think both actually play nicely into each other, not compartmentalizing someone's skill set. And also the fact that almost every new role in advertising, and in particular, I would say, with privacy and with Sandbox in particular, you kind of need to have a good blend of, of both. And I know, you know, that was a lot of the work that you and Julia were kind of helping to, to mend across the industry. Legal team, product team, commercial team, like how do you kind of all work together and, and, and sort of lend and, and build off of each other? It's my favorite thing to do in the world is like, give me a bunch of cross-functional teams working on privacy and technology and digital advertising. And like, let's, let's go do something. Um, love it. Wakes me up every day. <laughs> what advice would you give to someone who is just starting a career in either media and advertising or ad tech in particular? So the, the, there's like maybe two pieces and, and the first one's sort of like, no matter what industry, but it's like, find your people. Yep. Like it will make all the, and when I, when I say your people, just like the people who you admire, look up to, can learn from, enjoy being around and like want to spend time with after work too. Like that's going to make all the difference in the world. That's no matter what industry you're in. As far as like media and advertising advice, find people that help you get below the surface. I think a lot of the problems that digital advertising is like, looking at right now are from people not really like deeply grokking all of their customers and partners and competitors incentives and then also how the tech actually works and that to me like if you can if you can start learning that early in your career or like recognize that that's super important and find the people who can help you learn that stuff like you're going to go really far because frankly, not everyone does that. So if you do, you're going to have a perspective. I think it's super valuable. I agree with that. I wish, I wish more people asked me about the, the detailed nuances of technology. Cause I feel to your point, especially as it relates to privacy tech, it's like, so long as it just is said privacy safe, if it says, you know, privacy by some level of design, <laughs> that must be the answer. And you know, and it could it could be in both directions how the tech works, and then also like legally as well. Like I like both, I like those two audiences better. Like I like you know legal teams and compliance teams, and I like very technical folks. Whenever at least when we're talking about Infosum and and sort of data clean room tech more broadly, that's just a safer space for us. Where you know one, I think we can distinguish ourselves, but also it's like that's the. That is the level of detail. If we're trying to re-architect something, which I think all of us are, <laughs> it could be the core theme of this podcast. Um, if we're re-architecting and we're rebuilding and we're acknowledging that this, the way that we had done it before isn't the way that we should continue to do it, then like, I'm sorry, it takes a lot more questions, which takes more time. 
And so everyone listening on this podcast, like Alex and I are going to talk for a really long time. So <laughs> how would you describe what you do within media and advertising to a 10 year old? Mm. One of my favorite questions. Yeah, it's a really good one. Uh, it actually kind of forces that previous one, right? Like yeah. understanding. So I would say like, since I can remember using computers, it's been possible to track my behaviors across all the things I'm looking at, like since I can remember. I didn't know that, but that's been true. It's also been possible for me to access like seemingly endless amounts of like fun and informative things online. Yeah. And I think both of those things are still true for a 10 year old. Um, the I'm working on the first thing, right, <laughs> which is people tracking your behavior across all the things that you're looking at and making that harder to do and less necessary to do while keeping the second thing, which is like seemingly endless access to amounts of fun and informative things. So it's like, I like that. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, hopefully that's clear 10 year old Lauren. <laughs> no, that, <laughs> that, that is typically how you have to break it down for me, but that, uh, no, that's actually really very, very well said. What this is now, this is a deep question. What inspires you? Hmm. I'm going to like go through sort of like by relationships, actually. Uh, so my wife, Krista, has a huge commitment to her health, both physical and mental. Super inspiring, like runs up mountains like That's every amazing. day. It's awesome. My kids inspire me a ton and they are massively accepting of diversity and they reject the patriarchy and it's awesome. <laughs> and that's super inspiring as a, as a white dude. Um, reading history, like people who've like achieved like really big things, but did so while treating people around them well and, and having good humor. Like, yeah, those are, uh, Let's say, yeah, give me, give me all those things and I'll be pretty inspired. That's amazing. We'll, we'll definitely do a, a sub sector podcast of just like book club by Alex Cohn. <laughs> I love books. I don't read as much anymore though, because it's just too much work. Uh, you're well, you're, you're sort of solving some, some big, <laughs> some big, big challenges out there. Um, last of the quick fire to keep us on task. Uh, this is actually a little bit of inside baseball on how, InfoSum sort of welcomes new team members. So when we were getting okay. started in the US, it was it was really just two of us and then it became three of us and became grow, grow, grow um, over the past couple of years. But we kind of had the opportunity to sort of get to know our colleagues in sort of a you know new traditional way. And the one question we asked every newcomer was if there is a song that was a soundtrack to your life, what would it be? That's so awesome, like as a a, a thing like welcome people in it's a very um, diverse playlist uh that we yeah <laughs> that we have. yeah so you're not gonna like this because i'm gonna say two different things okay um and that's not that quick fire uh so currently i'm a i'm a huge uh boy genius fan okay or stan stan i think the kids say um and I regularly can be found like stamping my feet and bobbing my head to a, a song that actually won a Grammy, uh, not strong enough, but their whole like fleet of, of, of songs is great. I think if I dug a little deeper, like going back, uh, I, I can remember the first time I heard Bob Dylan's uh, with God on our side and it like knocked me down. And every time I've heard it since, like it has... And I think it's kind of tuned to that. I mentioned like reading history. It's like really tuned to that, but it also like reminds me of why I love history so much, which I think I mentioned as well. Like uh, my mom's dad had all these history books in this room that had this particular smell. And mm. um, yeah, so like I, I don't listen to it all the time, but like it, it's, it's, as I think about it, it like has shaped a lot of how my brain works. Bob Dylan. He's great. Love Bob Dylan. <laughs> I'll segue us. So more kind of topic related questions for this identity architects audience. Um, 
this is just perfect timing to have you on the podcast because I don't think I can scroll X or LinkedIn or read through newsletters without reading something about Privacy Sandbox. But before I get into sure. that, privacy is a core purpose that I know that you and I share. Uh, I think it was our first conversation when we were working together where I probably picked your brain for far too long. Um, because to me, it was just become, I was taking from a strategy lens and a who do we partner with lens and why do we partner with them lens and then tell me what AppNexus did when GDPR came around in Europe and you were so thoughtful and, and spent so much time. And, and then now, now here I am at Infosum to help create an advertising ecosystem that's better for consumers. So thanks to you. But ever since I've known you, privacy has been this central component of your job. And obviously you kind of went through um, that thread, that commonality um, leading up to your new role in Sandbox. But why is privacy so important? And what does a privacy first advertising ecosystem look like to you, Alex? Mm. Well, that was all very nice things to say. I'm kind of like super floored by that. Um, yeah, I mean, why is privacy so important? I am I am someone who believes that it is like a fundamental right. Like people need to be able to understand and kind of control the context of what they're sharing. Like I think about, you know, you walk into, if I walked into your living room and have a conversation with you, my expectation, I mean, you, you could go tell people what I said, but my expectation would be like, hey, Lauren is going to keep this to herself and maybe if, you know. So long as I'm not recording. Her, her, <laughs> her, dog's in, her dog's in the room, maybe the dog hears mm -hmm. and like goes and barks about it. But um, the, and then if I walk into like a busy space or like step onto a stage, right? Like my, I understand that what I'm putting out there, if I'm being recorded right, like is like, so like I understand it, right? Yep. So I think, when I say it's a fundamental right, it's not like there's not different sort of context for where you're sharing and like under, but, but the understanding and control over it, I think are really important. Um, but I also think what's really important, it's, it's not the only right, right? Like it's a fundamental right, but there are other fundamental rights. Like if you think about as privacy hits sort of like internet commerce, right? Like needs to be balanced. Yep. Uh, so like it, it's, it's like a super fascinating <laughs> intersection to me like how do we go do that there are a lot of things to balance but i do think we can get to an internet with better privacy protections like i think that's possible and i think it's also possible like i said in my like explain it to a 10 year old like it it looks like being able to experience like vast diverse open web without having to expose the complete set of data points of that experience right like yep. i can go traverse the web and not have to like worry that I'm exposing that entire activity um, or at least have control of that. Right. So control. that's, that's what I think it looks like. Right. Like I, I think it's some balance that is better than where we are today on privacy and data protection. And that acknowledges that like, it is really awesome to have an open internet that is, like and the reason that that exists is because it's ad funded and like we need to support that too. Yeah, I com I completely agree. And in certain markets, I think it's, even if it's not privacy first, I also think we have a pretty low bar in certain markets. Oh man. <laughs> um, to do better. Um, yes. Greatly discussed over the last year or two, but for anyone who's unfamiliar uh, listening to this podcast, can you provide an overview of the initiative, its purpose, its goals? Remember when people weren't talking about Privacy Sandbox? <laughs> we don't have that problem anymore. It is it is very much uh, yeah, I've been discussed a lot. So, but yeah, what it what is it like? The initiatives about like keeping people's activity private across a free and open internet. Like that's the that's the mission. Um, we know like publishers rely on ads to keep content free. Yep. And like broadly available as possible. Advertisers want to help people discover new things, give them offers. Like, and what we're doing is shipping features in Chrome and Android that effectively enable websites and apps to show people useful ads based on their activity with different parties without revealing their identity to those parties. 
Um, that's like in a nutshell what we're up to. And how, this almost feels like a loaded question. How, what, <laughs> what, is, what has the reaction been to Privacy Sandbox? What's the, what's the feedback? Yeah, that's super difficult to summarize. <laughs> And the reason why I think it like feedback depends really heavily like on your starting point. Yep. So do, do you think that there's even a problem in privacy? And I'm not saying this to you. This yeah. Is yeah. Do, <laughs> do you think there's even a problem with privacy and data, data protection to begin with in, in digital advertising? That's going to shape how you, you, you know, give feedback. Have you gone deep in trying to understand our tech versus like kind of, you know, just listening to somebody else's point of view. Um, so th those sort of dimensions <laughs> make a big difference. Obviously, there's there's a ton of different kind of segments that we're hearing from, and it's not just ad tech and digital advertising, right? There are people who spend a lot of their time thinking about privacy who are giving us feedback. There are obviously regulators that are giving us feedback. Um, so it's, it's very, point being, it's difficult to summarize but so for those who admit there is a problem and have gone deep in understanding what we're trying to do, I think the feedback kind of either comes down to, can you make it more private or can you give me some more bits? <laughs> and and the, the people who ask for more bits actually will acknowledge if, if that like, hey, that maybe you can do that in like a confidential computing environment, yeah. right? Like some something that's, you know, I just... Would love more bits. <laughs> um, yeah, so like, obviously, that's not addressing the folks that don't think that there's a problem or have like kind of let their POV be shaped by others. But like, we know, <laughs> we know we can do better on sort of both counts. Like, can you make it more private? Can you give me some more bits? Uh, we're, we're growing the team for that reason. Like we're not going anywhere. Maybe that's going to be sad news for some people, but like privacy sandbox has a lot more to do than just third party cookie deprecation and, and the current set of APIs that are out there. Um, so yeah, where we also acknowledge like on the people who, who haven't gone deep, that it is very difficult to understand what we're doing. Like I think, you know, tech lab gave us that feedback as part of their 106 page document that like. Hey, this is actually very difficult to come to a deep understanding. We hear that we're work like I been on a call earlier this morning, like working on how do we get like docs and discoverability of docs to a better place, like helping map the ecosystem use cases. The best thing I've heard, I actually like uh, Ronnie Gordon at Index Exchange said to me at one point, like help me map my business to the APIs. Don't make me have to figure out how. Mm. Yeah. So like we, we acknowledge all that and like, we realize the feedback actually could even be better if, if we made it, you know, as we make it easier to understand. So yeah, I like, that was a really long answer to no, I... how has the feedback been so far, but like there's been tons, right. And, and pre-existing me, this is like a four year old project at this point. Oh man. Like, we, we have lots of, we have feedback coming out our ears. Yeah, I think there's like, <laughs> you hit on it really nicely. I sort of see three interesting paradoxes, which is like, first and foremost, there's just the criticism. It's almost like Google can't win because it's like, damned if you don't deprecate those cookies and you push that deadline and then damned if you do it and you put something out there. The second paradox is just, if we all acknowledge we have to rebuild the industry, then it's just not going to be apples and apples. So like parts are going to, unfortunately, to your point on that balancing act, like parts are going to suffer and then we're going to have to kind of work through that together. But it's just not, it's just not going to be as clean and easy unless you just want to have a cookie replacement that looks like a cookie, <laughs> uh, which, which sometimes when I read the criticism, it's it sort of, you know, it. It, it feels that way. Um, and I think yeah. the third that's really challenging, and this is just unfortunate for those who are in the sandbox team working hard, who I know each of you individually who care so much about privacy, it's like you're still a part of Google. And so no matter what, there's this almost like disorientation of the fact that like I as a consumer, I trust Google Maps and I trust Gmail and I have all of these sort of direct relationships 
which then puts Google into a different position altogether as it relates to identity and as it relates to its relationship with the consumer. And so I think that part of it also gets really interesting where I see some like, you know, the criticism that doesn't have the details in it. It's like that it's just sort of like, well, Google's in the best mm -hmm. position to move forward. And it's like, yeah, well, like that's that's very different than what this this team is is focused on and, and trying to solve. So that's sort of my oversimplification when I look at it of like, I can see the different sides, but I also see how it's it's a really challenging you know time and position to be in obviously it, you know i'm a part of disruptive technology that's trying to challenge the status quo and change things as well so selfishly when i see the companies finally like pulling up their timelines believing that google's going to stick to a date realizing they have to move forward realizing they either you know have to put first party data to work and protect that data partner with others who have first party data, like that's sort of where our technology comes in to mm -hmm. establish a collaboration and to protect it. And have I seen the increase in people actually really taking Google seriously and then therefore like calling 1-800-INFOSIM and saying, wow, this is for real. So that like I was on pause, but now I'm really gonna kick this into gear and start to work with your technology. Um, you know, it, it, it obviously makes me really supportive of the initiative because of my philosophy on it, but then it also is advantageous for my business as well. For sure. Like I, I think the pickup over the last six to 12 months, like has been amazing to see. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I wish people would have gotten started earlier, but I understand why they were, they were hesitant. I, but it's been really encouraging to see a lot of companies starting to say, okay, this is going to happen. Let's engage with this thing. Let's start building. Let's give feedback from a place of having built something, which yeah. is actually super helpful feedback, right? When it's like, hey, I tried to use this in XYZ, right? Like, so yeah, it, and it's, then it's also good. Yeah, you're not the only one who's, who's told me, right, that, Hey, we're we're building a business predicated on more privacy for users that you know, frankly, is related to removing third party cookies, and we want to get in gear with our with our with our customers and on that mission. Like, let's let's do this. So it's like, uh, no, it's 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 encouraging to to see the activity, but also see companies like Infosum like embracing. Yeah, this change. Um, I think uh, that that gives a, me a lot of wind in my sails to see people embracing the change. Yeah, on the there has been more of sort of the feedback that I've read when people talk about cookieless feature. It seems like measurement and mm -hmm. with it transparency is probably like one of the more I don't know maybe confused maybe hot topics that are kind of coming out of that feedback for measurement. Like how is that being and and for more context, like when, you know, the past couple of years, you enter a year and marketers are under siege for proving return on investment. And you don't know if you're walking into a recession or not, like measurement comes in handy <laughs> to, to, to prove things out. So for all of the, you know, non ad techie audiences, so like shout out to my, my family. Um, <laughs> that, that's why measurement matters. Um, and for privacy sandbox, like, how are you thinking about it? How are you tackling it? Yeah. So there's a lot in that question, which is, is a really, really good question. Um, so maybe starting with really concrete things, like there are two core measurement related building blocks to what we're doing in Privacy Sandbox. There's something we call Attribution Reporting API, which is probably the most clearly named. Yeah, <laughs> I got that uh, one. <laughs> yep. Uh, and then there's private aggregation API, which is, um, it's more of a general purpose, like building block for kind of powering how tech companies might provide reach frequency and other types of measurement on top of sandbox. So two core, two core APIs, like kind of focused on measurement. I think, you know, that's what, that's what we've built. But we realize measurement 
is a is bigger than Chrome and yeah. Android, right? Like, so we've been, and you can see this uh, even tonight. Like, I'm going to be on a call. Uh, this uh, this will come out later, so you, <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna, you're miss, gonna miss this it. call, whoever. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna miss this. But but the the private advertising technology community group is actually really making some strides towards coming up with a standard that could work across browsers, which I realize still isn't isn't the full picture, right? Because there's more than browsers, but like we the standards process is massively important to us still. And and there's there is momentum on measurement, which is which is fabulous. So we're participating there. We've been public about how we're gonna do something now as Chrome and we've got those two APIs that I just mentioned. But like if if people converge on standards that look a little bit different, like we are open to that and we are participating in that. So we're thinking about all these like other channels as well. Um, I think you mentioned transparency. I don't like yep. as part of that question. Like, I realize this is like difficult for most people because they're not going to have maybe the ability to go do it themselves, but. Chrome, it's like the APIs that we're building, all of them, the measurement and everything else, like is is built in Chromium, which is open source. So if you think about like, well, what does open source mean? You know, people build a lot of things on open source. That's part of open source, but also open source means like I can see. Yep. <laughs> like for instance, like private aggregation, like actually both of the measurement APIs apply noise. How does that math work? Well, it's it's sitting there. Like you can go read it, and if you if if you don't have that capability, which by the way I don't, but like somebody can, and researchers and any like can can go write about it and think about it and reason about it. So like on the transparency side, that's what I would say. It's just like you know, it, it's Chrome, it's Android, both are open source projects. Um, yeah, that's how we're I guess approaching transparency and measurement. That's that's super helpful. And it's it's helpful because I, I think to your point earlier, when things are labeled attribution, it's like people just immediately assume that's it. And then if it doesn't hit on other capabilities that they would have assumed, it's like, okay, that's oriented to a mm. different um, API. Before I move us out of the sandbox, I have <laughs> I have a an impromptu question, which is like sure. more of a, a human question because you're my friend, which is like when I see the headlines and the feedback and the criticisms and I kind of walked you through a little bit of my thesis or how I, you know, orient why people are sort of questioning or, you know, being fairly constructive. But I also then think of you and I know how seriously you take your job, like the high standards of product, the care of privacy, like how are you doing and feeling knowing that this is such a hot topic every day? And it will be it like, you know, it's, it's not as though the, the criticism that we just referenced is going to be the last of the criticism. It's going to mm -hmm. continue until cookie deprecation is fully behind us. And then even moving on. So I'm just curious, like how you kind of take it in stride, but then keep at it. That's very kind to ask. Um, so it really helps that I love what I'm doing. And I realize that is a like something not to take for granted because I think a lot of people wake up in the morning and don't love what they're doing. Um, so I try to remind myself like, man, this is what a crazy thing that like the universe aligned where something I was interested in and had experience in became such a, a huge topic. So it's like trying to remember how much I love it yep. uh, when it gets kind of hard. Um, I said this to, to Ari Papara as well. Like I told myself this year, I've been like putting off, like doing the thing that I actually love even more than this job, which is snow skiing. I'd been putting that off the last few years and I was like, I'm going to do it this year. Um, <laughs> so like done a couple, oh, I've done a trip and then taken my girls skiing a couple times and we're going to do another trip and at the end of spring and looking forward to that. And then I think the third thing, and this gets back to like the advice thing and everyone says it, but like the people who are working on this are pretty astounding. Like I've only been doing it since April of last year. There's, there's people who have been trying to make this work well 
for a lot of years and I can think like they're all in my head right now. And like, if they can do it, like <laughs> I want to, I want to try to do it too. And, and when, it, when I say it, I mean like persevere, yeah. like listen, be deeply thoughtful about like what we're hearing, try to remember the North star <laughs> and like, remember to laugh too. Like I think <laughs> last night uh, was having a chat where, you know, classic, everyone does this, right? Like we don't use Slack, but we have chat, right? So like, just like some gifts going back and forth on like people being a little slap happy and like that, <laughs> that all, that's all how I like. Yeah. You got to lighten it. Yeah, yeah. Like remember, Hey, when all this feels like it's flooding on you that like all these people are humans and good people. And uh, yeah, this is a role that requires a lot of empathy because when someone's typically throwing, you know, calling your baby ugly or throwing stones, <laughs> whatever. I've, I've heard both of them actually related to Sandbox criticism, by the way. It's almost like you just have to say, well, why? Like, why are they feeling this way? Like, mm -hmm. you know, what role do they play? What's happening to their business? What challenge do they face? You know, how to like, how do we sort of get get through, to your point, listening and digesting, but then also trying to find a way to address the feedback and 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 also educate, which is is a huge, a huge thing the whole industry needs to do right now, which is just like knowledge is power, like educate, communicate really effectively. I think you know whenever it feels like the the mountain's insurmountable and it just feels like there's a lot of pressure. I love the phrase "pressure is a privilege." It's like mm. it it puts things in perspective. You could be working on something that no one is writing about or caring about. And it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of, I think, companies and businesses and, and individuals who are, you know, rooting for you and rely on you and the team to solve this. Man, that is a really good, I don't know that I've ever heard the pressure is a privilege thing, but like, I'm going to be sure to remember that. Yeah. If you're ever nervous going on stage, just say, pressure is a privilege. Um, nice. I like it. That's what I say. Um, so 2023, Google launched its pair solution, uh, sure. publisher advertiser identity reconciliation, of course, an acronym, which provided interoperability across data clean room solutions. InfoSum was an early selected clean room partner for pair. For anyone unfamiliar on this podcast, can you give us a quick overview of pair and why interoperability is really important for our ecosystem? Yeah. So one one quick asterisk on this, um, I'm not going to take credit for Pair, uh, nor is Privacy Sandbox. It's been a sort of creation of DV360 um, that they've worked on with you guys and 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 others, right? So I just want to yeah. make that clear to <laughs> clear to the audience that like solution coming out of Google that's not coming out of Privacy Sandbox, um, but cool to see. So. By the way, you're the more knowledgeable one on this, so I, I may kick it back to you. But like, it, as I think about Pair, it's like it's a secure, privacy protective way for advertisers and publishers to use, like, basically reconcile identity using encrypted first party data. Um, it's different from like identity graphs in that it's not pooling data. Yep. So advertisers have full control over their data. Publishers have full control over their data. The folks in the middle uh, are not the ones in control of the data. They're, they're helping make that connection. And I think that's obviously where the, you know, data collaboration clean room space fits in here. Um, yeah, I think in terms of getting into the the nitty gritty details, like I think, you know, it's a protocol, like it, it itself is not a clean room solution, nor is it an audience list. Like it's, it's just this series of encryption steps that can be applied to reconcile publisher and advertiser first party data. And, and it's, reasoned about and or you can reason about it in such a way as like hey there's this protocol here and then companies like yours that are already helping publishers and advertisers connect like actually can help facilitate 
like just make it easy, right? Like yep. I think that that's that's what so many products like exist to do is like make a a difficult technical problem easy and like get, get this out of my way. Like I would actually put it back to you. Like I think I don't you can you can speak best to like how Infosum has integrated like I'm yeah, I'm 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 actually kind of curious like how how it ends up looking, you know, to publishers and advertiser media companies that you're working with. Yeah, I think it it helps really solve for, to your point earlier, like for DB360 and for the fact that as people are adopting clean room solutions, they may adopt one and their partner may adopt the other. And so I think this notion of the protocol, um, well, first and foremost, the notion of the standards of saying exactly what you just said which I love, like, I love that it's coming in. It's like, there's no pulling of data. There's no matching table that someone's like more afforded and therefore understands like how emails all across the web are being sort of mapped. Um, that's very important. I think that's why when we first heard of, you know, Pair and sort of looked at the design and helped to influence it, like we felt really strongly because it very much operates similar to how InfoSum has always worked, to your point. Um, but it it works really nicely for, for this environment. I'm it's a little bit similar in the sense that like, while everyone's, you know, learning the new language that is clean rooms or learning the new language of data collaboration and not every clean room is the same and their privacy protections are different. I think, you know, there's always just a huge learning curve um, that, that sort of, you know, prevents, I would say, widespread adoption out the gate, but we are definitely seeing a lot of interest um, and we have seen a lot of interest and it's been great kind of being a part of that and working with the team. And I think that general notion and that the IAB also to give them credit, the IAB has worked through a lot of different standards and protocols that similar uh, achieve that notion of data clean room interoperability. Um, and so I think it's going to be continuing to lean on IAB, continuing to see pair kind of spread its wings and fly um for for uh for over this next year but i definitely think it helps it helps put push it along and i think for me it knowing that google has assets that they otherwise could have just said oh well this will be our assets that'll do this instead them looking to the industry and saying okay well who are some of the leading you know data collaboration platforms who can take on this protocol who can do this work on behalf of the clients and that there's a role for them to play i think is also a really good step in the right direction. I agree. I think it's rad. <laughs> this broad topic of collaboration, now I'm not talking about data collaboration, I'm talking about just like our market collaboration. If, I feel like it's a common theme that's coming out of conversations, especially on this podcast, is this notion of like collective responsibility. You're feeling it because you, you have trade bodies and regulators and customers who are saying, you know, hey, we got to work on this together and this is my feedback. But how do you see kind of this rise of collaboration manifesting within the industry and, and how in particular are you approaching it? Yeah, maybe I'll start sort of personally on this. Going back to like 2018, I, I didn't see this for myself. I actually will give, I shouted her out once already, but I'm going to do it again. I'll give Julia Schulman a shout for this. Like as I started getting introduced to privacy in this intersection with digital advertising, she made very clear to me that this is not an issue space, like privacy and data protection is not an issue space that's like a single company go it alone. And the way then forward is, well, where where do companies sort of like start coming together? It's like around standards. So in, in digital advertising, this is actually how I got into being interested in going to work for IAB Tech Lab was, hey, let's get around a standards table as industry and like hash this stuff out because no one of us can solve for this yep. by ourselves. And then I started getting introduced to like the web standards community who's like thinking about this issue. And it's the same thing, right? It's like privacy is and data protection, like they're, they're bigger than any one company. So it's just like by necessity, you have to collaborate. I think... It's encouraging to see people acknowledging, and InfoSum is a, is, is a great example of this, right? Like people and companies acknowledging like that the status quo, like that got us here, like, you know, it's important to recognize the things that got you to where you are, but like, 
it's not going to be the thing that gets us to a successful next 10, 20 years. Yeah. It's not sustainable. Yeah. And like, but again, for, for that to shift, you have to collaborate. Like I think in terms of like how Google's approaching this, right? Like it's kind of proof in the pudding, like the hours invested, the thousands of hours invested in let's go have this conversation out in the open and, and have like logs of the minutes of what we're doing, have uh, GitHub issues, which I realize are technical, but at least like where people are, are feeding back and they're meant for, hey, let's, let's discuss and collaborate and think about how we do this. Like we, we know this is going to take the ecosystem. Actually, my product role is like in the ecosystem part of what we're doing. So it, yeah, I think in a nutshell, like, yeah, the, there is no way to go improve privacy and data protection in the digital space without like deep collaboration between people and companies. Yeah, I think that's right. Otherwise, everyone's just talking past each other and you're trying yeah. to, <laughs> you're trying to rebuild something. You're like, the way you're talking about that is very different than how I see the world. So it does take, it does just take a lot of time, effort, attention, patience um, at times. And then you know, and I think you, it also just takes pioneers who are saying, like, not only do I also believe in a way forward, but I'm going to test. And so I'm incredibly grateful. I think proof is in when people are trying new things and seeing value out of that. And so for us, it's like I give the it's, it's not even me talking about like, you know, InfoSum or privacy. It's like my clients who test and then show others that this is working and that this can work and that this is performant, like that makes all mm. the difference. It makes it so much easier. It, it, it gives a guidebook and a, you know, a, a rubric for others to follow, um, which I, th I think is really important. My, my final question, um, sort of on all of these broader topics, um, outside of just like getting you to promise me that Google's going to kill the cookie in 2024. Um, <laughs> What are some of the things that excite you about the industry and where we're headed this year? Kind of specific to my world of like privacy and data protection, like I think the potential for advertiser and publisher control going forward is exciting. Like I think obviously advertisers and publishers have been in control of a lot of things to, up, up till today, but I think the increase of that uh, is super exciting to me. I think new tactics that have to do kind of with that to some degree, at least at least one of them that I can think of, like think about like publisher media company audiences and sort of the like leverage that they have, but like also the opportunity that I can create for like advertisers and agencies to like explore buying on audiences that are coming from you know, media companies from publishers, obviously like you can't have a podcast without saying like retail media and CTV, but. Or AI. <laughs> oh yeah, crap. <laughs> AI, um, generative AI. Uh, so, but it is still cool. Like, and as it relates to sort of what we're doing, like when I say we here, I'm talking about me and you, right? Like anyone who is like, an identity architect or like thinking about privacy and addressability going forward, like sort of this shift into retail media where it's not only just like interesting new inventory, but also new interesting audiences and interesting like measurement opportunities. Yeah. Those are things that like, th those are exciting things. I love that. Well, I really appreciate all the insight and the answers. And I know our audience and probably the many new audience members will have as a result of you being on this podcast um, are going to appreciate the insight and advice and, and transparency into what you're working on and why you're working on it. Cause I think the why is really, really important. Um, this podcast, as you already cited, identity architects is about the individuals who have pioneered new ways really to deliver better customer experiences, to think about data differently, to protect that data. When you look to people you admire in the industry, who would you nominate for us to interview for an upcoming episode? I've already given it away. <laughs> um, and I don't think and I don't think you've talked to her, right? I haven't. And as soon as you were saying, Julia, I thought to myself, like, we have to have her on the podcast. So I was hoping you would yeah. say this. Now it's official. 
Yeah, so J Julia Schulman, who's now like GC Chief Privacy Officer, actually at Telly, which is a really cool, very cool uh, company startup. And the reason I would say, like, I she's she's been a mentor and friend and collaborator for a while now, and I would not be doing this job if it weren't for her on many many different levels. So, like, yeah, you should definitely talk to Julia, and then I'd be interested to hear who she picks. Yeah. I think this yeah. would be great. And I'm, I am really excited to learn more about telly and how they're thinking about it. Cause they're really going to be yeah. poised to, you know, to have a, lot, a really great growing asset and, and hopefully collectively we can give them the tools to control it. Sure. All right. Well, thank you so much, Alex. This was amazing. I really appreciate not only your time, but just everything that you're doing and you know, you've never not put, care and thoughtfulness into the work that you're doing. So even when the criticism comes, just know there's a lot of people who see that. So thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. This has been fun. Thanks again to Alex for joining us. That was an amazing episode that touched on so many incredibly important topics to the long-term sustainability of data-driven advertising. I really appreciate Alex joining us and providing such an honest and open insight into the progress being made over at the Privacy Sandbox. All that leaves for me to do is to remind you to hit that subscribe button so you'll know where the next episode of Identity Architects lands. But until then, thanks for listening.